Beneath the surface ticks millions of clocks in every computing device that we rely on. From your watch to your microwave, these tiny silicon traces perform millions of math calculations every second. We take it for granted. The amazing amounts of math that is required to run this world of ours works only because we have faith that every calculation is correct. Computers are part of our DNA as a society. As anyone who has freaked out over a Twitter or a TikTok outage can attest, when devices fail, it causes chaos. But there was a time before reliable calculations. Let's go back and see our own history. The year was 1943. Hitler's war machine had taken control over most of Europe. The war in the Pacific was being waged island by island. The army had a problem. They were wasting ammunition because of the lack of ballistic tables, also called firing tables by people in the field. The army's ballistic research laboratory was responsible for calculating these tables. These firing tables were crucial for soldiers to aim their artillery. But the problem was complex. The firing tables had to take into account everything from wind speed and temperature to air density and the humidity of the gunpowder. The firing tables that worked in Germany wouldn't work in the Pacific. It was a big responsibility to get them fast and get them right. The basic problem of the exterior ballistician is always the same. To study, improve, and predict the behavior of projectiles or missiles in flight. The ultimate purpose of all this is to design projectiles and compute firing tables, both of such accuracy that our combat units get the maximum number of direct hits. The Army partnered with the Moore School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. They hired hundreds of female mathematicians to calculate these firing tables using specifically built calculators. We were computing ballistic tables on a hand calculator. We were computing, and we were computers. Well, it was interesting because they were recruiting all over the country. There was a big ad in one of the Philadelphia papers saying that the Army was looking for uh, math majors. The work was very manually intensive. The computers couldn't keep up with the demand for new firing tables. Something needed to change. As far back as 1941, Dr. John William Mockley at the University of Pennsylvania was using grad students with calculators and differential analyzers to solve complex math problems. This gave Dr. Mockley the idea of a general purpose device to do calculations that could be customized for specific problems. This led to the 1942 memo called The Use of Vacuum Tube Devices in Calculating. This was the birth of the idea. But bringing it into reality was not a certainty. At the Army's behest, Dr. Mochley's team took over a year to design the device and over 18 months to actually build it. The project blew through one deadline after another. It was clear that the device would not be delivered on time. At the end of the day, the ENIAC cost nearly $8 million in 2025 dollars, almost double its original budget. It was completed in November of 1945, months too late to help the war effort. The ENIAC was a technical achievement. The machine could perform a single operation in only 20 microseconds. This speed was primarily because of the use of vacuum tubes. In comparison with earlier mechanical relays, vacuum tubes were simply several orders of magnitude faster. And I would take students over there and we would see some of the scientists there working with vacuum tubes which could distinguish between pulses which occurred sometimes as close as a millionth of a second apart. If you can count and distinguish pulses which are occurring at uh, rates which are as close together sometimes as a millionth of a second, it seemed obvious to me that uh, 
those same abilities of vacuum tube circuits could be used for the just the mere act of computation. Generate your own pulses your own way. Taking up an entire room, the ENIAC weighed 30 tons and used 18,000 vacuum tubes, 1,500 relays, and hundreds of thousands of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Not a single transistor was used as it wouldn't be invented until 1947. Programming ENIAC wasn't an easy task. In many ways, the engineers who built the device weren't interested in programming the hardware. The job of programmer didn't yet exist, but they had many subject matter experts. The Moore School of Engineering's human computers. Out of the pool of 200 human computers, six were picked to be the programmers for the ENIAC. Kay McNulty, Betty Jean Jennings Bartik, Betty Hobleton, Marilyn Metzer, Francis Spence, and Ruth Teitelbaum. And uh, I can't remember exactly whether it was Goldst Goldstein, Lieutenant Goldstein, or John Holbert, who came to me one day while I was working on my shift and asked if I would be at all interested in working on the new computer that was being constructed upstairs. For years, these women were thought to be refrigerator girls or models for the pictures. Instead, these were incredibly capable mathematicians who were employed because of their deep knowledge of the underlying math involved. They had been forgotten for many years, but eventually got some of the recognition they deserved. If you're in the computer field, uh, from the very beginning, you're going to be the first in a lot of things. The programmers had to be able to read and understand the schematics of the complex machine. With the help of John Malkley and the entire engineering team at the Moore School, they were able to start programming this revolutionary device. Now! When you ran a program, it was really spectacular. In fact, for years when Hollywood would show a movie and they wanted to show uh, computer working, they would uh, show this, uh, the ENIAC doing a trajectory. Unlike today's computers, the ENIAC wasn't a stored program computer. Programming the device required manually setting thousands of 10-way switches and physically hand-wiring the machine. Debugging the algorithms required testing the logic and the hardware. The ENIAC was a son of a bitch to program. The computer was known to be buggy. The vacuum tubes burnt out at an average of one per day. At that time, the emphasis was on the invention of the ENIAC. I mean, developing the mechanics, the hardware. These women developed concepts from scratch, like subroutines, nesting, and program flow. This was the dawn of coding, where many of the original concepts were invented from whole cloth. Somebody from Moore School, I just don't remember just who the person was, uh, gave us a whole stack of blueprints. And these were the wiring diagrams for all the panels. And we, they said, here, you can figure out how the machine works and then figure out how to program it. Well, the thing is, it took us so long to debug a problem because you put, plugged in cables and set switches and... We had these big trays that ran around the room, and uh, uh, one carried the program signals, and one carried the data. Even though the ENIAC missed the war, it was used into the 1950s for key research. This included one of the first calculations of thermonuclear reactions that supported the work on the hydrogen bomb in late 1945. One key area where the ENIAC was used was the validation of the Monte Carlo methods. These methods end up being of value across many scientific fields. The ENIAC was an important step in creating every computer that we rely on today. It represented a first step in the scaling of large problems beyond what was possible through the sheer volume of human work. We still use these basic programming concepts that were pioneered in that first computer. The ENIAC is whose shoulders that Grace Hopper, Dennis Ritchie, Barbara Liskoff, Bjorn Saustrup, and Linus Torvalds stand on today. This is a history that every developer ought to know.